Hello. Hello! Welcome back to our channel. So today we have a food quiz challenge. We each prepared five different dishes around the globe. To avoid any repetition, I chose dishes from Asia and Europe. And I chose dishes from the Americas, Africa, and Oceania. The rules are pretty simple. Just if you guess it correctly, you get the points. If not, then just... Too bad, so sad. <laughs> if you're interested who comes out on top, uh, just keep watching. All right, shall we begin? Let's get started. Who want to go first? Rochambeau, rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Woo! Right. I will go first. So okay. the first dish is this one. Looking at this picture, I want you to describe a little bit what you see. When I first looked at this picture, I thought it was coffee from Turkey. Ah. <laughs> and then when I look closely, I feel like it's syrup on the ice. But you are not choosing anything near Europe, right? Mm. Nope, that would be out of my range. Okay, let me see the map. Let's see. I feel like it's something somewhere cold, so maybe it's from Canada? Alright, drop your pin and we'll see if you get a point. Okay, I'll move the first one to Canada. Alright, you are correct, although the exact location in Canada is pretty oh, far off. I think it's something around here. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're still way too far north. Regardless, you get a point because okay. this is Tire sur la neige in French, mm. or of course, you can also call it maple taffy in English. However, this is also something that's very popular in New England, where we call it sugar on snow. Ah, oh, so it's like Quebec? Is yep, so Quebec? Quebec has it, New Brunswick, and New England, especially the northern parts of New England. There are a few different ways you can eat this, but really, it's just boiled maple syrup, which you pour over some snow, and then you eat with a stick or a fork right off the snow. In New England, you also have an interesting tradition where you eat this with a pickle. Ah. So you take a bite of pickle, you have some sugar on snow, and that cuts through the sweetness because it is very sweet. Okay, interesting. Moving on to the next. Do you want to try? All the right. First one. Now my turn to lay a point. It is 1-0, so the pressure is on. Ah, okay. Unfortunately, you've fallen into a trap. I know this one. This is from Georgia. Yeah. We were talking about going to a Georgian restaurant at one point. Now I just need to find Georgia on the map. Oh, it's right there. Perfect. Okay. Was that correct? Yes, it is correct. It's the most signature dish in Georgia. All right. So why don't you tell me a little bit about the, the dish? I forgot what it's called. So this is actually called Hasha Puri. It's a signature dish in Georgia. I choose this dish because I think it's an interesting marriage of different culture based on its name. So Hasha actually comes from Georgian, which means curdled cheese, while Puri comes from Indian, means bread. It is suspected that Hasha Puri originated back in 12th century, where Georgian went through a renaissance period, and Hasha Puri could be a cousin of pizza. But since tomato didn't exist in Europe until the 16th century, Hasha Puri is only made with cheese and bread. So lastly, I want to emphasize that Hasha Puri actually exists in different variations in Georgia. And this one I represent here is called Adajuri Hashapuri, where it represents the geography and culture of that region, where Adjara is actually in the Black Sea. So you can see that it is shaped like a ship, where the sun is represented by the egg, and the cheese represents the sea that you are married with, or you are flowing into. Hmm, <laughs> interesting. Not to nitpick with the Georgians, but if your sea is inside of your boat, that's generally not good. <laughs> it is very nice. I look forward to trying this. Yeah, and you know when I was doing research on Georgia, I actually saw that their other signature dish is a dumpling. That's oh. like shaped exactly like what we see in China. But mm. they emphasize that it's nothing to do with Chinese dumpling. I, I guess you just like the feeling with different spice, but I'm very interested to try it. And I feel like since Georgia is next to Russia, Eastern Europe, and also some like Middle East country, this culture actually married from different regions and it will be interesting to try their cuisine as well. Definitely. All right. Are you ready for the next one that I found for you? Yep. Okay. I don't remember what order I put these in, so let's take a look. 
Okay, let's see. Ah, okay. What is that? Why don't you describe what you're looking at? So what I see is some potato and veggie in a pit. I feel like by how it is being presented, I feel like it will be a dish from South America. That's what I think. Right. And then based on the map, I actually not have much knowledge about South America. So I'm just gonna have a random guess. Brazil? Alright, grab your next marker and drop it where you think it is. Brazil! All right, we've locked in our guess, and unfortunately, ah, ah, that is not correct. Okay. So this is called hangi, and hangi. it's hangi. 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 My pronunciation is also pretty poor because it is a Maori word. Ah. Uh. So, do you remember where the Maori are from? They're from New Zealand. Oh, okay. So this is a traditional, almost barbecue-like cooking process. What you do is you make a big fire and you heat up some stones. And as the fire burns down, the stones go deep into the pit. And then you cover it with baskets filled with meat. And then you put baskets of vegetables on top. Of course, you put down hookah leaves mm. or cabbage leaves or banana leaves. And that will help insulate the meat and the vegetables from the heat of the stones. You then cover that in wet cloth and wet sacks, uh -huh. put dirt on top and let it cook for six hours or so. And you dig it out and you have a big feast. Oh, it resembles something that I heard about how you cook the peak. Yes, um, in Hawaii. Right, right. So this is, I think, a pretty popular cooking method in a lot of different places, but especially Polynesian cultures, uh. which include New Zealand and Hawaii and other places in Polynesia. They'll okay. have this method of cooking. So it's like a luau in Hawaii. I see. Interesting. Okay. So unfortunately, no points on that one, but yeah. now it's my turn. Yeah, me on to your turn. All right, let's take a look at our next item. This one may not be so obvious. Hmm, let me take a closer look. Let's see, I see pancakes. Potatoes in a creamy sauce, some onions, and some carrots. Okay, just based on the look of it, which region do you think it's from? I would have said Europe. Because mm. I also see parsley there. Mm. But... Wait, parsley is only from Europe or...? I don't know. I feel like I associate it a lot with Italian food. Okay. But my guess is it's not Italian. I'm gonna make a wild guess. Mm. I'm gonna go Eastern Europe. This has gotta be Eastern Europe. I'm gonna try dropping this in... Ukraine or Romania? What do you think? I can't tell. Alright. Romania. The answer is no. Ah. <laughs> but I'm not sure if the picture is a little bit misleading because it's not pancake if you look closely. It's a protein, so have a second guess what it is. It's actually pork belly. Oh, pork belly. Mm. I don't think that would change my guess very much. It would definitely eliminate the Middle East, I think, mm. for the most part. But I would definitely say still Eastern Europe. Did I get the general region correct? This is actually a signature dish from Denmark. Oh. I'm not sure if I pronounce it correctly, but it's called the Stick. Flisk, and it's a Danish signature dish where it's basically cooked with pork belly with the parsley and white sauce. This dish was first invented back in the middle of 17th century in the rural Danish countryside where it's very common to cook the pork belly with the tomato, you know, as the very signature Northern Europe dish where you have the potato and a type of meat, you know, the, <laughs> the plating I feel like it's really a symbol to that region. Yeah, it definitely um, looks very rural, rustic very homey. And when it hits the city restaurant, it becomes a signature dish. I think you should definitely try it if you are hoping to visit Denmark during the winter season. Because this is the kind of dish that people would normally have, at least what I saw on the internet, once a week. But I'm not sure nowadays will be the case given pork belly has kind of greasy. Mm -hmm. But I would definitely be interested to try it. Yes, definitely. That does yeah. look fascinating. Okay. All right. Are you ready to guess my next one? Yeah. Let's go. This is so fun. This is fun. We should do another one with other stuff after this. And turn, Here turn, we turn, go. turn. Take wow. a look. Okay. At that. This is a ceviche in a coconut. That's what I think. And I think this is from Peru. All right. Well, drop your pin then. Not sure if it's correct. But that's my first guess. Peru. All right. That is an excellent guess. You have great reasoning, but <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so this is called kokoda or kokonda is how I saw some people pronouncing it with an N, even though they don't spell it with it. I'm not really sure. Mm. But what's funny is it's actually been described as a Fijian ceviche. So okay. it's from Fiji instead. 
Interesting. Now, you were right, it is basically a ceviche. So it's raw fish cured in lemon or lime juice and then tossed with miti, which is coconut milk mm -hmm. mixed with other vegetables, usually onion, tomato, cucumber, cilantro, coriander for our Brits out there, stuff like that. Okay. And then traditionally you serve it either in a coconut or you can serve it on lettuce leaves. Another thing that I thought was pretty cool is the way they extract the coconut juice. Okay. Online I saw people saying, oh, you just use a cheesecloth or something and wring it out or you can use some bark if you're more traditional. But when I watched people make it from Fiji, they were just grabbing the coconut with their hands and like squeezing the heck out of it to get all the milk out. Which I thought was pretty cool. We should uh, definitely try this. Yeah, I was just also wondering because as we learned from Peru that their cuisine is deeply influenced by the Japanese way of cooking. That's where ceviche was invented. Is that a similar case in Fiji? Ah, so I don't think so. I think in this case it's just making use of what you have. So if you have on the island lemons and limes and nice good quality fish and coconuts, it makes sense to mix the fish together together with all of these other ingredients. So mm -hmm. it seems to be an original Fijian dish, or at least Polynesian. I would definitely want to go visit. I would also want to try this, yeah, it yeah. looks amazing. Moving on to the next one. All right, time for me to guess. Since I only got one correct based on the three dishes, I secretly hoping you don't get this one right. <laughs> all right, we'll see. It sounds like you're a little worried, so, huh. Isn't this so appetizing? It is, that is very appetizing. <laughs> So the first thing I'm going to think of when I see this is it's got to be Malaysia or Indonesia or somewhere like that. It looks very similar to that. I see it looks like pandan leaves and then there are a bunch of different stuff inside. So I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to guess Indonesia. Hmm. She's not giving anything away with her expression. You All can. Right. That's cheating. Indonesia and... <laughs> oh, watch this. I have the technology. But you're correct, it's from that region. This is a dish called lamp rice from Sri Lanka. Ah, uh, Sri Lanka. I wasn't gonna get Sri Lanka. I choose this dish from the region because it represents a marriage between different cultures. This dish actually originated and carefully prepared by the Dutch burger community settled in Sri Lanka. So mm -hmm. you can see there's meat, veggie and potato rice in the center and wrap it by the banana leaf so you normally like pocket it together and steam on the stove i think the way that you can resemble something with how dutch are preparing the food is by the way that they cook the meat so they use sweet spice like clove and cinnamon to like you know marinate the meat and cook it together so normally this dish would be handed down on the sunday gathering for people to share within the community but i feel like it looked very appetizing so I want to put it here and then hopefully we can try it in the future. Yes, indeed. Man, it's a good thing we just ate lunch. Otherwise, we would be starving from this episode. Did I get a very good one? That was a good one. I wouldn't have guessed any Dutch influence looking at the picture, but I guess it does have potatoes. All right. Are you ready for your next guess? We're currently tied on yep. this score, right? One to one. <laughs> Editor, put it up there and there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mmm. So this one would definitely be something in Caribbean. Or it can also be something from like Africa. Is it from Ethiopia? <laughs> what country? What <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ethiopia. <laughs> I'm sorry for all the uh, Ethiopia. Is what Ethiopia. Thinking. But that's the only country I know from Africa, so I think it's not that obvious. I think given my limited knowledge of this region, my next guess is Libya. All right. No. <laughs> you actually said the right answer. It is Ethiopian. That obvious? Yep. So this is called Dorowet, which is a chicken stew with a onion base. Uh -huh. So you basically cut up a bunch of onions, simmer them off for a really long time, throw in a whole chicken, which you've sectioned into its 12 parts, mm. and then let that cook. You also add some spices and clarified butter, which has been spiced up as well. And because it takes so long to make, you'll really only have this on big family gatherings or on special occasions. How long do you normally need to cook this? So online, I saw it might take about eight hours to do the whole thing. And so you've got to marinate the chicken with some vinegar or some citrus a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then it takes a really long time to cook down the onions and then you still have to cook it for a few hours after that. Oh. 
So when they say eight hours, I think that's maybe a little bit on the long side. Mm -hmm. But of course, with a stew, you want it to cook for a pretty long time. The other interesting thing is you'll put in a boiled egg at the end, so that'll soak in some of the flavor as well. Okay. And you'll notice that it's served on traditional Ethiopian bread, which is made from teff, and it's called injera. Mm. So you tear off a piece of that, and you grab the sauce or the chicken or the egg with that, and that's how you eat it. The important thing about Ethiopia food is that you need to eat with your hands. Exactly. Yeah. So that's something that a lot of cultures, I would say, in that kind of longitude, have in common is you eat everything with your hands. Is that from India that you have to eat with right hand and, and not the... with the left hand? I've heard a few different places. I think India is one of them. Correct us if we are wrong. I know there are a few places probably that have the same tradition where you only eat with your right because the left is used for other things. <laughs> <laughs> My turn to guess the next food. Let's take a look. All right. Huh. So. First off, this has olives, so that's pretty obviously not East Asian. I see some lettuce, I see what looks like, I don't know what that looks like. It looks like something with turmeric. Will you have this down? Ha! Huh. I know I succeeded. Okay. <laughs> hmm. Alright, this is a, that's a tricky one. I don't know if I know this one. Well, it's still one to one. We each have one more chance after this, so I think I can be a little bit risky. Mm. Let's grab our pen, and I'm going to guess somewhere Mediterranean, or, because you've been picking tricky places. Hmm, let's look in the Mediterranean what options we have. You know what? I think this is Spanish. We're gonna go with Spanish. Looks like it could be a tapas of some sort. Okay, drum roll. Close. Was I? It's from Portugal. <laughs> oh, that's not even Mediterranean at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, when you're thinking about Portugal, the first thing we'll think about is egg tart. But... Hmm, that's true. That's actually the second thing I was thinking about. I thought of port first. Port? Port wine, yeah. Oh, but they are also known for eating sardines. Ah, oh, so that's sardines? Yes. This is actually called... Bacalao brush. I don't know how to pronounce and I don't trust myself. So there's a saying in Portugal, there's over 365 ways of making sardine because they just love it and you will make it one day each day of the year. So this dish from the picture is actually made from shredded sardine um, with thinly fried potatoes with scrambled eggs and onion. And normally it will be like garnished with olive and parsley. It is actually originated from a region near Lisbon. And I think it's become a signature dish where you can just eat everywhere from Portugal. You know, I used to think the canned food like those sardines would be very fishy. But according to this recipe, or at least what people have been saying about this, it actually tastes very fresh. Mm. So I'm very tempted to give it a try. Okay, that could be interesting. I don't know how tempted I am personally, <laughs> but that's because my impression of sardines is just the ones you get in a can. Uh, and that's a little bit less appetizing. But yeah, that's the dish that I chose for um, Portugal. We're on to the last dishes and we're still tied one to one. One, so let's see who can take home the crown. <laughs> At least we make good choices. That's true. They're very interesting dishes so far. I don't know if I want to try the sardine one, but everything else seems fun. Chang, chang, chang. Okay. This one, I feel like it's a very Western style of making. It's resembled like a hot dog, but I feel like it's made with like pesto sauce. So it's definitely not from Africa. Maybe from Australia, maybe from United States, but I feel like it's normally in the US we have it with mustard and ketchup. I'm not gonna say anything because you need to figure it out for yourself. Untainted guess. Because we already have something in Canada, right? So, is this just gonna be US? Drop your pin. I'm getting a little nervous because I want to get it right since it's the last one. US or Australia. Do you want to do eeny meeny miny mo? Remind me who colonized Australia? The UK. UK. Yeah, so the UK's big English-speaking colonies that still exist are Canada, the United States, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and maybe Jamaica. That doesn't help. Okay, I'm gonna go with Australia. Drop your pin. No, wait, I wanna see your face. <laughs> Drop your pin, <laughs> wherever you're guessing. Go with the US. All right, hit that drum roll again. No! Ah! <laughs> Victory is within my grasp. So, 
This is actually from Argentina. It's called a choripan, which when I heard it, I thought it sounded very Japanese because, you know, they like to smush words together like that. But choripan is chorizo on bread. And you're right, it is kind of like an elevated hot dog. So the green sauce that you're seeing is actually chimichurri, oh. which is a parsley, oregano, chili pepper, olive oil, red wine, vinegar sauce. And of course, chorizo is a spiced, spicy sausage. And then the bread that they use is usually either French bread or Spanish crusty bread, something long and crunchy. Okay. This is really popular at sporting events or if you're having an asado, which is like a big Argentinian barbecue, you'll have this as an appetizer. And you can serve it one of two ways. You can serve it kind of like a hot dog in the US where you have the chorizo hole, or you can have it like this, which is called mariposa, which means butterfly, mm. where you cut it in half and it flips in half. Moving on to the last one. All right. Today. Pressure is on. If I don't get this one, it's a tie. Oh. I think you've shown me this before. I think you showed me a Korean show where they went to China and they ate something that looked exactly like that. Is it? What, is this? what are these yellow things though? I don't know, it's, it's gotta be Asian. My first instinct is to say China because I feel like I've seen them eat it. Maybe it, is it from Dongbei? <laughs> I think she's I trying can't. to pretend that she doesn't, she's trying to keep a straight face. I'm gonna say China and specifically here. Yeah! Was I correct on the region too? Yes. Ah! Was well, it in the Korean show you showed me? No, it's not from the Korean show, but oh. <laughs> I forgot the Korean show, but you were right. However, this one I specifically picked because I want to give it to the audience. I want to introduce this one. Mm. However, I figured you didn't know it. So, anyway, you win. But before we end this channel, before we end the show, I think I need to introduce a little bit about this dish. It looks Kinda interesting for you to see the picture. It's actually originated from Northeast China, the Heilongjiang province. And as you know, a little historical background about like this Heilongjiang province, the proximity with Mongolia and Korea as well as Russian give it like a mixed way of like how they choose to cook food. And historically, back in the 19th century, a lot of Han farmers from like the Shandong district all settled here. So that actually shaped how the whole like Heilongjiang district cook their food. So it's a mix of the Shandong province, mix of Russian way of cooking, Mongolia food with Korean style of cooking, as well as the ethnic group within that region back in the Manchuria period. So a lot of Manzu actually live in Heilongjiang district as well. Mm. From the picture, you can see that's a stew. And the reason there's a lot of stew in the Northeast China is because it's very cold climate. And back in the ancient nomadic tribes, all the people would carry their food in a big pot on their backpack. And then they just like travel around when they get to a destination, they will just throw everything that they have in this big pot. That's where the stew come from. So what are the yellow things on it? That's what I'm curious about. Is that bread? So the yellow thing you see from this picture is actually made from cornbread. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is called tie guo dun. And the way you make it, you just basically cook everything together, you know, the meat, the veggie, you know, in a big pot. After everything is being cooked, then you put all the, you know, cornbread like dough along the edge of the pot. So you just stick on them before it's being like fully cooked. And then you cover the lid, let the steam sort of cook everything through. And that's where you have the dishes here. So normally you can eat the bread with the soup and it's very delicious. It looks very tasty. One thing to highlight about Northeastern Chinese cuisine is due to its cold climate, people prefer more stronger taste. So things will be a little bit more salty, more sweet uh, compared to, you know, what you will normally have from the southern part of China. So I've taken the crown today. We should probably play this game again because we yeah. have so many more countries food to discover. We can also make a series about dessert or a cocktail, but just like, please comment down below what you want to see. But we at least really enjoyed this challenge so this far. It was a lot of fun, yeah. I hope you've also enjoyed this episode of our food quiz challenge. If you find a name for it, you can also leave a suggestion in the comments. We wish you a happy holiday and we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye! They are also known for eating sardine, 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 okay. But they are also known for eating sardines.
Sardines. Sardines. <laughs> you can do it again. <laughs>